All right, let's get started. Thank you for taking um, some of your time today to attend this webinar. My name is Brian Verbort, and I will be helping lead us through um, some of the capabilities that are available to you in the product design and manufacturing collection. Uh, we frequently abbreviate that uh, as PDMC, so you may I may use uh, those terms interchangeably. Uh, they're just essentially referring to the collection of products that are uh, made available to you um, with the Autodesk product design and manufacturing collection, including Inventor and AutoCAD and uh, various other products that we'll dive a little deeper into. I'd like to actually have this conversation be less of a how are you doing your 3D modeling today and more about um, extended capabilities that you might be able to leverage and use in your organization for your design development. So just uh, beyond the maybe the great products that you guys design and bring to market, um, but the process that you use to accomplish that and the applications that you might use to help facilitate that process or add a new aspect to the process you currently have. The idea behind many of these tools is to allow you to accomplish and facilitate the development of your products. And we're going to go ahead and have a discussion regarding that uh, so that you can make good products, develop a good process, and make sure that the products you're developing work and are and can be brought to market. Uh, things like uh, the CAM tool paths, the creation of CAM tool paths that you know ultimately once the design is done you need to make parts in the physical world. So uh, doing that, uh, facilitating that, those are the types of, of um, capabilities we'll be discussing today. The graphic here on the screen is designed to capture the capabilities that are built into product design and manufacturing collection. So everything from essentially getting an order uh, for your organization, uh, the sales side of things, all the way through process of uh, visualization and appropriate documentation uh, for, the do for the designs that you're, you're bringing to market. And that includes many things that we don't necessarily think of as like a, a purely inventor type of a, a process or a role, um, but things like ma additive manufacturing, the machining process, the, the design of the, and the optimization of the factory um, that you might have your, your own shop floor or those, those factory fl shop floors um, which uh, your customers are filling with your equipment. So these capabilities are going to allow you to be more innovative and uh, have a a better business process, more streamlined, and uh, facilitate manu manufacturing a little bit further. We're all talking all about performance, essentially. First, uh, the design work is the foundation, certainly, of everything. And so that's where we'll go ahead and start a conversation. Uh, that, that's the uh, where we will begin here in the inventor, in, in, uh, enter into discussing the inventor product and some of its capabilities. Now, most of you are probably already uh, familiar with the inventor, some of the inventor capabilities. So we won't be spending a ton of time here. We'll just go into some of the general capabilities of inventor. And uh, those, especially those that are well known, we probably won't be going into a ton of depth in, in those parts of the product. Um, we'll also going to be covering some of the points that uh, or processes that you might have that would be facilitated by other products that are in the manufacturing uh, product design manufacturing collection. Kind of a large goal. Uh, we're going to try to keep it simple uh, as to not be overwhelmed or distracted by too much extraneous information. So the foundation of a vendor. Uh, what makes a good design? So as an engineer or a designer, I want to be able to focus on the design and less about how I'm using the tools um, and the feature controls that are available to me in, in the design tools like Inventor. Um, we're looking to speed that, compress that design process and get more detailed, more correct models to the shop for production and then ultimately out to market. We want to make sure that we're quickly creating those features and 
get and getting that that information in an easy um, consumable way into the hands of the manufacturers whether we're doing that in-house or externally there are generators that uh, built into the system we'll take a closer look at those and uh, the ability for example to get uh, a great flat pattern out of a 3d folded sheet metal part that you might create an inventor and slide that out across the desk uh, quickly to the shop floor and get it to the laser cutter or water jet that you might be using uh, or a turret punch press that might be in play at your organization for uh, supporting that sheet metal environment that's just one small example we also have the ability uh, to support the structural elements of your design in the assemblies that you might create rigid pipes and tubes and flexible hoses and those types of uh, aspects of your design that you may not currently be documenting uh, or not completely documenting in your workflows. In addition, a little more detailed information about the design automation tools that are available to you that you may not be aware of or using uh, at any length. Uh, really, we're talking about iLogic here. Uh, it's a it's an application that's provided to you as part of the product design and actually uh, product design and manufacturing collection. No wonder we abbreviate abbreviate that, right? The PDMC, <laughs> and uh, it's one of the most powerful and kind of effective ways to save time in your organizations. You can do things like define rules quickly, uh, so that um, you can make variations on a theme without doing a completely uh, from scratch customization uh, to, for may maybe handling some of the variations on your product line. So you've got the ability to customize if you build rules into the design up front and the Hive logic capability that provides you with that customization and logic. This is going to certainly uh, help you to win more business because you've got the capability now to do the variations on a theme in a much quicker way and you more easily kind of understand the scalability of the work that you're doing in Inventor. Interoperability used to be one of the biggest hurdles for most companies. Translating files is always a challenge. Um, you know, asking the customer for multiple file types because you're not sure which one they're going to provide that's going to work the best uh, and will open easiest in your environment. And th those are kinds of stumbling blocks. You just, it's hard to predict how long those, uh, those roadblocks um, can take to be removed and overcome. But uh, the idea being here that the any CAD capabilities that are built into the inventor product of the, in the PDMC is something that allows us to really remove that burden. We can simply open the file and maintain it in an, an associative way into maybe our design that we're working on in inventor. So being able to forego the translation quote unquote process in general and worrying about which file type you need to get from your customer or being seen as quote unquote hard to work with because you know the customer that is you know, paying you for the development of their products is going to be compensating you for that you know the you're fussy because you have they have to export to a particular format or something of that nature so having that be a more open kind of a relationship uh, allows you to be a lot better teammate a business partner your clients the beauty again here is that the the documents themselves change that you've been provided in a SOLIDWORKS format or whatever it might be um, those designs that you've incorporated that your customers provided for you to use as reference will also be associative and, and change so if the client makes changes to their model you simply just open your model that's referencing that document and allow the updates to occur uh, if, uh, if you so desire. So uh, again, with, with more interoperability discussion here, let's talk about uh, BIM. Uh, building information modeling is becoming a, a larger 
uh, discussion that we maybe in manufacturing haven't paid as much attention to. Um, but the reality is that uh, everything that you know we build in manufacturing uh, either gets shot at a building or uh, is goes into a building. And so for us to be able to embrace the um, building manufacturing aspects and our partners that we may be working with uh, that require have BIM requirements for the uh, deliverable. Certainly a huge uh, hurdle has been overcome with the interoperability um, that Autodesk has given us with uh, interoperability between Inventor and Revit. So these building projects can now be a part of what we're taking care of for our customer. We're assisting with them and providing uh, detailed information, but not too much detailed on information back to the, them, the clients, um, really thinning down and lighting, lightening that, uh, that heavy 3D model with all the detail in it that we need to manufacture into a lightweight model that has the information that they need to incorporate into their layouts, their floor plans, and their architectural designs, what, uh, whatever those might be. So we can quickly simplify and using automation tools, including iLogic in many cases, to author those objects in a way that the, our, our, our consumers, our, our customers that are leveraging BIM can just incorporate our designs directly in. And again, for us to see the benefits of uh, any changes they might make, and then if we built off of their um, geometry, our geometry will update as they make changes to their source models in Revit. Last thing about Inventor we'll mention here is collaboration. So uh, it's it's becoming more and more important to work in a uh, dis distributed environment, um, whether it be you know be due to travel restrictions or uh, cost restrictions. It, it's expensive to travel. It's expensive to get hotels. It's uh, um, inconvenient to try to continue to have conversations with uh, you know with your organization when you're in travel mode. So minimizing that's important and a big piece of that is allow, allowing us to collaborate. And um, there's a great collaboration tool that's, uh, that accompanies the, the product design and manufacturing collection with regards to uh, Inventor and the ability to do um, use the shared views as, a, uh, as an option. Um, for online collaboration, essentially anywhere, anytime, and leveraging the cloud to, uh, to do that. Red lines, markups, all the things that we traditionally would do face-to-face uh, -face over a desk on paper um, are, are virtualized now. And uh, if you haven't taken a look at that, those capabilities recently, it might be a great time for you to do so as they're built into the, the collection. some detail here in the form of just a quick uh, video which shows those capabilities that we have. So here you can see um, we can quickly uh, we'll take a look at making a certain grouping of expressions in iLogic, building those uh, reference dimensions into our model that can then allow it to be quickly updated and leveraged for uh, for variations on a theme for size. Quickly making changes to the products, um, whether just getting started on a new product or reworking an existing one, uh, being able to, as you can see in this example, of use a form to enter information in and uh, make sure that we get dimensional changes made in a quick and easy way uh, where those dimensions can be identified as variables. And if you're doing your designs and, and considering, you know, if you're using Excel to kind of plan a matrix of, of dimensional information, you're already uh, three quarters of the way there uh, as far as with regards to utilizing iLogic in this case. And iLogic has many aspects to it. It is 
a core part of a vendor and it's developed right alongside it. So drawing information, the properties that go with the drawing information um, are, are those things that are also included. And so it's not just about making changes to the geometric modeling, but it's also the supporting documents that are, um, or, sorry, the other, other supporting information, uh, metadata, if you will, that goes along with our designs that can be um, altered quickly and easily along with materials and, and uh, tolerancing information. iLogic, uh, I mentioned before, is included with every uh, seed of inventor, so you've got it. It's just a matter of uh, taking a look at it and, and certainly help you identify uh, areas of your designs that might benefit um, pretty rapidly from a, uh, a, a limited effort uh, to deploy. And it's, it, it's great technology because it's not something you have to like uh, in mass, you know, shove into your organization. You can uh, target a small portion of a, a, a well-defined design and uh, get a feel pretty quickly for some of the automation, the capabilities and um, flexibility that the iLogic code and the environment therein would allow you to, to take advantage of. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the integrated tools for Inventor that are part of the product design and manufacturing collection as well. Everybody uh, wants their assemblies to fit, certainly, um, but perfection isn't a, isn't a reality. It's not an option necessarily. You get as close as you can, um, but at what cost, right? Uh, how when do you reach that reach that that the boundaries of the diminishing returns? So if you've got some idea of the impact your manufacturing tolerances have on the machining cost, you probably already have questions, you know, about if you're going too far and unnecessary tolerances are being met and held, or if you're maybe not doing enough and the fear is that things aren't going to fit. So getting that sweet spot, that probability that things are going to work uh, and having a, a confidence that that's the case versus the amount of time that you might spend trying to get it too close to perfect and uh, that time is lost. Also, the ability here, not just with the tolerance modeling, but also stack ups, the ability to do a tolerance modeling stack up uh, for fit and function are critical for uh, many of us that are working, especially the tight tolerance, but also uh, at the other end of the spectrum, a large tolerance design environment where you, you could be maybe allowing larger tolerances without any ill effect um, on uh, the fit and function of your designs. Certainly, we want to make sure that the products that we're delivering work and aren't uh, flimsy and uh, prone to breakage and, and uh, return uh, RMA requests, etc. So taking a good product and being able to design and then ensure that that product will function correctly in a uh, very diverse and sometimes hostile environment. It's certainly helpful to be able to do that by bringing to bear some of the factory layout tools to make sure that your products fit in the building as well as um, the extended capabilities that are built into Inventor in the pro in the the products which analyze your soft, your your applications or your products. So being able to do advanced FEA, um, those tools are built in and they're optimized for designers to use as well as analysts. So there's a, a different kind of an interface for those uh, different uh, user types, if you will. You can check for Nonlinear fatigue, thermal vibration, dynamic simulation is also available. Product uh, capability that's been built into Inventor for quite some time, and most people just don't know about. So, dynamic simulation is a, 
is a key and core part of what is embedded inside uh, the pro uh, product design manufacturing collection and inventor. And all of these, these uh, additional products that we're talking about here, the extended products, are all um, developed in co concert with one another. So you, you really don't necessarily have issues with compatibility when moving from one of these, um, these very specific uh, tools you might use in design with a, with a general uh, inventor core application. In addition to that, you know, it's, it's important for us to be able to optimize our own work environments with equipment placement and you know, production workflows on the shop floor. So one of the things that's built into the product design and manufacturing collection is the factory design utilities, which uh, allow us to do just that, and optimize flow through your, uh, your factory, your shop floor. Um, the, that product uh, that is an add-in for, for Inventor and sits side by side with it and works to allow you to uh, develop and check to see if you're adding any uh, roadblocks, pinch points, et cetera, or safety issues uh, into maybe a, an adjustment that you want to make in your factory. And again, also this you know rubs both ways. You, your customers may actually um, once they see you or you can offer them the ability, may want you to help them optimize using the tool sets that, uh, that you have at your disposal. So now you've got an opportunity for delivering services maybe to customers that you hadn't really considered before. It may open a customer up that you'd never had access to in the past. And so being able to go after new clients or to service an existing client in new ways um, certainly is something that the product design manufacturing collection, the members of that collection uh, can accomplish, help you accomplish. We spoke about the FEA and the simulation, the thermal and uh, vibration and the net dynamic simulation that's available to us. For detail on the, the CAM side of things, uh, CAM is built in to um, the collection and has partnered up with the Inventor CAM software. So the ability here, the, the benefits are certainly that um, any changes that you can make or that you might make in the, in the 3D modeling side of things in your design engineering departments um, would be impacting the tool path for maybe a design that's already or about to be in process in the shop floor. So if there's any last minute changes that need to be made, it's always a rush at that point in the process because you didn't anticipate needing to make that change. So the faster we can adopt those changes, the better um, and get the new uh, model to the shop floor. Well, if the shop floor is really just allowing a toolpath update based upon the modeling change that you made to a design or revision or whatever it might be, um, then uh, there is little or no work to do on the CAM side of things. It's uh, uh, certainly reviewed and validated on the CAM side before being put into, into play, but the, the designs would al will already have the new tool, the new tool path or updated tool path uh, associated with the modeling change that gets made in the, in the inventor environment and the 3D modeling tightly integrated. If you're doing sheet metal, then uh, you've got multiple flat parts and they're certainly uh, varied in size and thickness, but the ability to nest those shapes that you're cutting either with a uh, laser jet or water jet, uh, or even using, I guess, a punch press uh, capabilities makes, meant, makes a lot of sense to to be able to nest those shapes to optimize the material that's being used and minimize the amount of waste. So there's another capability that's built into the collection that allows you uh, to nest and then hand the, the tool path off to you know, maybe a, a router or something of that nature once it's, uh, the information's been nested and be able to really um, take advantage of and cut costs 
really, uh, when it comes to waste. Uh, being able to nest uh, remnants from a previous job into a, an upcoming job. Uh, very easy thing to accomplish in an inventor nesting, um, certainly assisted by the inventor itself. So again, something we haven't talked about here is because inventor's the core of all these capabilities, we stay in that inventor world, meaning that the there's not such a learning curve. We're already familiar with the way that inventor thinks and, and the types of information we might want to add into uh, uh, and work within a design environment that's, uh, that's based upon inventor. So really, we're just talking about an incremental uh, uh, change that would really assist adoption. And again, changes that get made on any of the punch press layouts, the sheet metal you know, folded model that gets created in inventor, those update in the flat pattern. And obviously, as a result of that, the, the nested components on uh, in the inventor nesting environment are updated as well. So similar to the way we're talking about the standard CAM and machining process, uh, we can take advantage of that, that connectivity as well, that associativity. This is just a quick simulation of a design that's been made. You can see it's a tubular frame. It's been created. And uh, this was done in Inventor. And there's a simulation environment that's associated with the frame generator capability built in to the product design and manufacturing collection in the form of the inventor tool set. So being able to take your um, static frame members that you might be uh, developing and to quickly and easily move those into a, a testing environment where we can check for function and uh, failure, certainly um, very important. And uh, this analysis environment is fairly lightweight because we're using the cross-sectional um, cross-section of each of those members. And so it's not an extensive, lengthy process. And again, if we were to make changes to any of those elements, then we might, uh, we would certainly realize the, the benefits here in just re rerunning an existing simulation uh, to check that maybe we've met where there uh, are some deficiencies. We've reinforced a corner with a rib or um, added, a, a in, enlarged the size of a cross member wall thickness or something of that nature where we've maybe in the past identified a weakness and we're going to do a rework based upon new information we're gleaning from the simulation. So this is a fairly, I mean, it's a, if with this, this video, we sped it up just a tiny bit, but the reality is that this does work fairly lightning fast, again, because we're, we're not doing quite as much meshing and uh, the standard cross sections are, are what are utilized there. There are multiple ways to do this. You know, uh, Inventor NASTRAN is built into the PDMC. So you could have, choose to, to go that route, more of a traditional workflow. Um, or you can do the simulation capabilities I mentioned that were built into the frame generator components. And that's, that's something that's uh, not trivial either. There's a content library that goes with, that's part of the manufacturing design and collection. And, um, it has a lot of components built into it, including these frame members and you know, nuts, bolts, screws, washers. It's a pretty extensive library of components, uh, standard components that can then be used in your designs. And if you choose to do that, there's some functionality capabilities that kind of go along with that. And we'll see that uh, shortly. I'll be doing a quick uh, live demonstration of, uh, an, of, of, of a change to be being made in, in a design environment. So we've been focusing on the integrated capabilities that designers can be using within the inventor environment here. Other tools um, that extend what people can accomplish in their organizations are also available. So supporting your existing 2D workflow. There's a lot of AutoCAD drawings that are out there in, the, in, this, in this world. Uh, companies have been utilizing specifically AutoCAD or 2D work uh, heavily for, for many decades. And that's because in many instances that it's quick and easy to deliver that information 
However, it does tend to be deficient in some areas. So a combination of both TD, 2D and 3D is probably you know, a, better, uh, a better decision or choice. Or, or certainly, even if you're, you're dedicated to 3D and moving forward, knowing that that's maybe the right decision for you and your organization, and we don't want to have to do this Herculean task of moving everything from 2D AutoCAD into 3D kind of in bulk. Uh, we don't want to get caught with you know one leg on each side of the fence with our you know maybe a migration of our 2D data. So there are still use cases for that AutoCAD information to be either new AutoCAD information being generated or uh, the adoption or transition or migration of uh, of that 2D data. So it still has value and uh, certainly we'd be remiss if we didn't respect it. So a lot of companies, a lot of, of CAD tools can import information, um, but it's a lot of times it's not easy to, to do that create change depending on the complexity of the design itself and the type of change that's being requested. And there are certainly other workflows that are heavily um, and well served for 2D uh, being uh, you know electrical schematics and controls panel control panels things of that nature. So being able to continue with a kind of a 2D workflow for the Sparkies in our organization, they're doing controls logic and uh, the mechanical team that maybe prefers working in Inventor in 3D uh, is, a, is a really op a big opportunity for an organization to kind of allow those two disparate teams that may work together on a design certainly, but uh, are using different tools and for good reason in, in a lot of cases. So schematics can be created within the, the 2D environment that you're either AutoCAD electrical preferably or hopefully because you have that. That's a AutoCAD electrical is part of what comes in the, the PDMC as well. And it's specific to doing development of those types of, of designs, control schematic designs. And there are a lot of benefits all on its own of, for doing that. But the ability then to take that information and, and uh, make it available to those that are doing the mechanical designs kind of bridge that gap between those disparate teams can have a real benefit in eliminating issues, unforeseen issues, because we're kind of putting these two disciplines together at the end of the day and the poor guy that ends up having to do last minute wiring on a piece of equipment because you know something wasn't anticipated uh, as he chases it out the door, you know, and guy is trying to shrink wrap it at the same time. Those are the types of things that, that can occur in the real world that uh, make it tough and uh, you rack up some uh, some overtime hours sometimes as you're trying to get that last unit shipped. Um, but there's been a, a, an issue with the, the teams not being able to foresee these, these kinds of issues working in different environments. But to be able to merge those two environments together with the electromechanical workflows that are available in uh, between AutoCAD and, and Inventor in the collection. Certainly uh, tremendously helpful. A little bit of a uh, comment on adoption. Um, certainly would make sense for the uh, mechanical team to kind of get up to speed with uh, their own tube and pipe and, and wiring capabilities that are available to them in Inventor. Uh, and that, you know, there's an, also an effort that the, the controls logic, the schematics guys would um, take on uh, the responsibility of, of learning and understanding the uh, AutoCAD electrical capabilities. And, and so at some point you'll have two teams that are getting up to speed and well-versed with the, those two different applications that are specific to what they do and to their design needs. And then uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as a tertiary effort, those teams would then be brought together and melded um, once each of them in their, uh, in their own time and space were familiar with those, 
those aspects of the product design and manufacturing collection that would be melded together and become a cross-functional team at that point. The facility itself and the ability to um, scan and work in a in a 3D environment, uh, looking for interferences and uh, factory floor layouts, critical at at, the, at this day. I mean, the, the cost of doing scans, point cloud collection information of your your facilities, uh, the cost has come down. There's more people doing it. It's getting more competitive, and uh, that information is more easily leveraged uh, in upstream and downstream applications as uh, it's collected. Uh, they tend to be large, you know, files, but um, there are ways to address that and uh, minimize the impact that that has on performance. You may not be aware of it, but um, part of the collection uh, is the the factory design utilities, as well as um, cinematic quality rendering, which can be accomplished in, by using uh, 3ds Max. So the ability to do simulations of even a factory floor rework or build out, uh, it, it exists in the in the products. It's just a matter of, of implementing those, getting a little bit of knowledge on how those things work, and then folding them into your workflow. We talked about the, a lot of the extended tools in the collection, um, and we we're now maybe a little more aware that, that that these tools are available to us as a PDMC customer, and as part of the maybe your your internal initiative to uh, to deploy more of your work process in to to support 3D. Let's talk a little bit about maybe a, a little bit more advanced or a view on the future. Um, although many of the, uh, the designs that have been created using generative design capabilities uh, are um, have been in place in the in the market for quite some time. And it's not a difficult tool to use. Generative design is is tool that allows us to satisfy a design criteria um, by simply providing that criteria and then and then applying a AI environment to develop the geometry for a model that would then satisfy those requirements. It's not necessarily a tool that's going to do your design work for you, but it is part of that process and would help supplement it and validate maybe the de designs that you might have in your head and uh, help refine them. Uh, it also is going to be a huge or is a huge benefit to those of you that are trying to um, be more sustainable in your businesses. So reducing the amount of material that's used or required. Um, the tendency we have to overbuild where you know we're not making something that is shot into space, uh, it, it really can be um, a tremendous uh, material consumer um, if you're just overbuilding everything without doing some sort of simulation or lightweighting effort. And in a lot of cases, that lightweighting effort can seem like it's very time consuming. But well, the reality is that lightweighting effort can, is, is supported by and can be taken advantage of by the the generative design tools that are built into um, Inventor and the, 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 as part of the product design and manufacturing collection. Take a break here and I'm going to go ahead and jump into a demonstration of one of the uh, beneficial capabilities that are built into the product design and manufacturing collection. So give me a second here and I'll switch over uh, to a live session of Inventor and walk through just an example of another capability or another um, aspect of this product design and manufacturing collection um, in the form of extended inventor capability. So hold tight for just a second and let me get that up on screen.
OK, so here I've uh, brought up a session of Inventor. And I'll be running through kind of a, a workflow that's capable or uh, that you have capabilities to reproduce and um, the product design and manufacturing collection, the capabilities built in to that, uh, to that uh, collection. So let's see, I want to make sure that uh, we can see everything. So I'm sharing. We're OK there. I'll just be opening an existing assembly. This is a computer um, enclosure and all the components to go with it. There's an opportunity to kind of show off a little bit um, some of the things that we just discussed and uh, and um, seen. So this uh, computer enclosure has a complete um, series of electromechanical components in inside it's been built into it. Um, and so you can see here that uh, when discussing previously um, the ability that Inventor has for the mechanical team uh, to place components and build assemblies. Uh, it's probably, you know, it's a well-known uh, capability in the software, but probably not as well-known and certainly not as well-adopted as the capabilities uh, for the electrical, electromechanical crossover. So we're talking about, you know, hard, hard components, uh, mechanical in nature, uh, and a blended environment with things like uh, cable and harness and routing uh, of wiring through this enclosure in the system. So uh, the those tube and pipe and cable and harness capabilities are part of what you get in the product design and manufacturing collection. Um, and the inventor is the is the core utility that's being brought to bear to to give that uh, those capabilities to you. So in this case, we can see kind of a enclosure that's uh, in a various state of completion here. I just want to drill down into a little bit uh, single area here, something uh, not a big tremendous uh, whiz bang, uh, but something that we do so frequently that um, we just don't give it thought and the redundancy and the repetitive nature of it. So what I'm going to do is uh, expose you to a little bit of some of the generators that are available to us in um, the Inventor and via the product design and manufacturing collection. So what I'll be doing is the scenario here is that we need to mount this uh, this fan assembly uh, so it's connected to the you know the the back wall of the housing here for making sure we don't overheat the system. Uh, we see that we've got the the uh, the fan enclosure and its framework here and the blades etc. So it's ready to be installed. It's been already uh, con constrained in the location we want it to be in. But now we've got the the, uh, the task of building the bolted connection that's going to fasten um, the housing here in place. So some of the things that we have available to us uh, in the assembly environment inside Inventor are what are known as the design utilities or the design generators. So you can see here that I just simply, in an assembly environment, can click on the design on the ribbon there, and it exposes us to lots of different design specific tools. So in this case, I'll just uh, scroll over a couple of them. The one that we're going to be using here for our purposes is the bolted connection generator. And almost all of these tools that you'll see me scan through really quickly here uh, have, the, have a, a, the potential or their nature is to help you with some sort of an engineering task in addition to um, building out the model and constraining the components kind of all as part of a single effort. So in this case, uh, I'll just hover over. You can see what's going to be happening here is I'm going to be selecting the faces that I want this connection to be uh, running from and to. At, at the time of, of committing those specifics about where uh, these uh, this enclosure is mounting from and to uh, on the housing, it's it's essentially going to be automatically creating the appropriate sized hole and the fasteners. So I'll have some selections that I'll be making along the way here. Uh, just before I get too deep into that, I did want to show some of the others, uh, the uh, other design components that we have available to us is these, these gen generators. Um, they work in much the same way, but they're very specific to different tasks. So in this case, you can see that there's a clevis pin generator and you know we would uh, assign locations and forces for this, uh, uh, for this clevis pin. 
the system would build out the components themselves and the fasteners that uh, create the clevis pin connections. Uh, we have the same thing in a series of tools here that are available to us for the frame generator. We mentioned that previously, being able to do uh, create frameworks very quickly and easy, easily uh, by selecting pre-existing content center library frame members with, uh, that are standard in industry that have you know wall thicknesses that can then be analyzed for uh, for failure or, or um, success as far as uh, bearing the load that they're being expected to run within. We can take and miter those corners. Um, any skid-based design would take be a great uh, application of, of this this, gen, gen, this particular generator. It, it ultimately builds out the frames, and you get to decide on the joints and the connections between them. You can see that we can create joints, we can reuse uh, um, frames. So if we've got rights and left hands and we want just basically a, an opposite hand for a larger frame that we might be working on, that's all well supported. There's the frame analysis tool that we were talking about. This is the tool that's just running an analysis based upon the cross-sectional information in the, in the, in the members of the frame environment. Uh, spur gear development, um, B-belt systems, so again, the result here is have all of these components uh, specified by you and then have the system create, place, and constrain them. So really doing a lot of work kind of all in one shot here as, as opposed to this all this incremental kind of one step at a time stuff that we're doing. Um, different types of uh, connection environments, uh, the ability to, to specify a spring based upon requirements. Um, and then have it pull that spring from the standard law, standard content center library, or to specify a spring that's not standard and have the specification created for us so that we can take it out to quote to have somebody manufacture it or what have you. Um, so we've got a lot of capabilities that are here. Anytime that you're in the assembly environment on the design tab, that's where those generators live. Um, lots of additional power transmission stuff, almost all of them result in uh, the placement and location and constraining of components into a, as a system. So it makes sense for us to maybe take now another look back at the opportunity that we have here to uh, essentially use one of those generators, the bolted connection generator, uh, to lock this, um, this housing for the fan in place. So all I'm gonna do is just initially initiate the bolted connection tool. And I have lots of opportunities here to interact with the software. I can um, put in uh, or define the location of this bolted connection by picking an existing hole or uh, linear edges of, of existing geometry. Um, I can do a, uh, do a bolted connection by selecting different points and different terminations. I'll start out just by using the existing holes that are already part of the component as we purchase it, right? So they're anticipating we need to anchor this thing. And so the, these, this particular component shows up with holes in it um, in particular locations. So we'll just use the by hole location. Um, and then I'm gonna be selecting information about the start and finish point. So this connection goes from somewhere to somewhere and that's all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna provide that information. So the start plane for the fastener, I'll just uh, orbit myself around to the other side here. I don't think I got into the assembly in the right way. Oh, here we go. So there's the start plane is on that back face here. I want it to come from the back. The fastener is going to be coming from the back and penetrating into uh, the enclosure with a, with a nut on it. So you can see that it's giving me a, you know, just a linear arrow there. Um, but then I've got additional information. So I'm using an existing hole here. I'll make sure that I'm going to identify that or make sure that the software knows that. And I'll pick an existing hole. As soon as I do that, it's, it's querying that hole for the size and it picks the next available uh, hole that has a particular clearance value set for it. So you can see here that that's a going to be um, the hole that is being that this connection is being bolted into will be quarter inch. So there's a lot of intelligence that's happening kind of along the way here. In addition to that, if if this hole happens to be a pattern of holes, we can tell the system to recognize those by using the, 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 the pattern. So you can see that it's highlighting the multiple locations here and previewing that pattern for us. I can also come in and say, once well, now that I've told it to follow the pattern, 
uh, to go ahead and just uh, select the termination. So I'll let the software know we're about to select the termination that's going to be on this this face towards us. We started the hole penetrating from the back and going to the front here. So I'll just pick that uh, that particular face where the holes exist. And you can see it's highlighting that geometry. Again, the pattern is being highlighted as well as the source uh, uh, hole there that I used, et cetera. The other thing that it's doing now is it's uh, starting to build out because of what we selected. It knows that we want to look uh, at, at using the ANSI threads. I can make adjustments to that. I can change to a metric if I wanted to from this list here. I can also take information and add it from the content center library. So we wanted a, a bolted connection here that's not just a, a hole that goes through those two parts, but we want uh, nuts and bolts on, on and washers on either side of that. We can simply just do that by adding fasteners. And this is the kind of a preview uh, in the sequence of the fasteners that we might want to add. So in this case, I'm going to add a fastener. It's going to reach out to that um, very deep and uh, well filled out content center library. And it's looking for standard components. Uh, in this case, uh, it's looking for a screw that we might want to use, a screw or bolt. Um, to accomplish this bolted connection. And there's a significant you know, number of these components and different types of head styles, et cetera, that we can use to accomplish this. I'm just going to go with, a, I don't know, let's go with a machine screw, cross recess machine screw, yeah, that's fine. And you can see what it's doing is it's adding it to the list and the bill of materials for the assembly and giving us a preview of what that fastener is going to look like. Ultimately, this is where we're building a connection. We'll be able to see a mistake before we make it and preview uh, the connection as we kind of go through the process and completing it. So maybe I want to put uh, another um, fastener. Uh, so the screw's coming from one side, but maybe on the other side here, I want to add uh, a, a, a washer. We'll get a washer in place and you'll see it adding the washer. I can then come in and I can add another fastener if I wanted to. You know, maybe we're going to have some vibration and we're going to want maybe a not a nut but a, another washer. So I can get a self-locking internal tooth and just continue that process of building this connect, connection out. You can see how it's doing that work for us here in uh, the preview environment different uh, faces we selected and the holes that have been chosen here. So I can go ahead and continue adding fasteners. In this case, we're going to want to put a nut on the back of this thing to kind of machine screw there to accomplish that. And then it's just simply a matter of going ahead and building that connection out, letting the system define where the nuts need to go and what size is being used. You can see that it's been accomplished at all four of the connections that were chosen as part of that pattern. And we can take a look along the back side here and see that where those uh, that countersunk head is locked into place as well. So this is the kind of thing that um, really makes a job easy to do. Uh, I can come back in and I can make adjustments. I can change the size of a fastener if need be. And it would actually update and change the diameter of the hole that is penetrating through the wall and the fasteners are connecting to. So there's a lot of intelligence built in here that allows us to kind of get the job done uh, very quickly and very easily. Um, speaking of bills of materials, I'll go ahead and I'll go to our assemble tab here and I'll look at the bill of materials. And we can see that connection that I built. So this was the bill of materials um, directly from Inventor based upon you know, the work that had been, been done on the enclosure and the sheet metal environment and uh, components that are harness components that are already in this enclosure. But this is, uh, this is a result of the efforts that um, I had made. You can see that these components are um, identified and their quantity is specified. And they're even being identified as being purchased parts because they're pulled from the standard library. We know that they're purchased items. So it's a, uh, it's a differentiator here. It's not a not a make component. It's not a raw material, but it's something that gets purchased. And that kind of information is critical for our purchasing person as well as accounting, so they know whether we're to assign labor and 
uh, uh, do something or if it's just a raw material being used to, uh, uh, internally to, to produce a component, et cetera. So with these generators, there are many of them. Um, you've got lots of opportunity built into your inventory here in the product design and manufacturing collection to start leveraging some of those things as well. And that's just one example. In this case, it's an example of many examples. Um, but uh, you can imagine how much time this might save you when you're trying to, to build out your assembly. And I'll just point out here too, all, all the components that have been um, generated here, you can see are listed here, just like they would be naturally in the, in let's just call it the, their native environment, natural habitat. So if I'd gone through and done all that work and placing all of those fasteners, uh, the result would be the same here as what you're seeing that was done in an automated fashion quickly. And more importantly, the modification of uh, any of the locations and sizes associated with that generated component will update um, and reflect and update the bill of materials as well. So that was just something that uh, it's, it's a, pretty easy to adopt. It's not a huge thing. You, you essentially make sure that you have the components uh, you know, that you might want to use in your organization. That content center library has, uh, I've heard people say, a million or so parts in it. So there's a good chance the standard components are there that you might want to use. Um, and also kind of the next thing that comes up sometimes is uh, there'll be a question about, well, we want our, our own our internal part numbers to be um, part of the bill of materials when we're talking about the content center library. That's why we don't use it. We're aware it's there, but, you know, well, that cust that library can be customized fairly easily uh, to include your internal business company specific part number for that particular lock washer or lock nut um, and even stock information if that's what's important to you. So it's a database and you can simply just add new columns in that database and add that information in. Uh, let us know if you have an interest in, in doing something like that. We've uh, expanded that content center library for uh, many customers um, with great success. Certainly, some, you, you wouldn't want that to be the one thing that keeps you from adopting technology like this. All right, well, that's kind of everything that I had planned for uh, to show today. Hopefully, you found it beneficial and helpful and maybe uh, spurred you into action on something, um, let us know if we can help in any way. Uh, there, We do have a, a couple minutes for questions. Let me, um, I don't know if we've gotten any questions. This is, um, this particular uh, webinar, like most of our webinars has been uh, recorded. So if, um, if somebody you know maybe signed up for this and didn't get a chance to attend, oh, I believe we're sending out a recording of the, uh, the demonstration and the discussion uh, that we've had here today. Okay, so with that, um, I guess we'll wrap it up today. I really appreciate your attention here. And uh, if you've got uh, questions, um, Let us know if you have them, just reach out to us. Uh, if, uh, if we haven't gotten your question answered here on the, in the um, response panel and the questions panel. Thanks so much. We really appreciate your time. Um, hope, to re hope we're respecting it and uh, we didn't run too far over. Really appreciate your attention and uh, have a great day.